We continue with the launch of the N64 with an issue that has both a Mortal Kombat game and a Street Fighter game covered for the first time in a while with Nintendo Power number 89 for August of 1996. Our cover game this issue is the N64 port of Mortal Kombat Trilogy. We have some general complaining in the letters column this issue without too much of note. Just a general across the board stuff. We do have a, however, have a change in the power charts. The Virtual Boy is out and the N64 is in. And the N64 is going to last much longer. Now, initial picks are strictly from Nintendo Power editorial staff. Um, we have yet to get voting results in as yet. Presumably, presumably since those also usually include sales information. Otherwise, new to the Super Nintendo ranking, we have Lunar 2. Now, the N64 has a Mortal Kombat game in the launch window, and we have coverage of that with Mortal Kombat Trilogy, with information on each of the new fighters on this version of the game. Mortal Kombat Trilogy is a game that shows the potential issues with the N64 controller when it comes to fighting games. The game tries to take advantage of the six rows of face buttons on the N64. A and B, and then the four C directional buttons. With the light and heavy kicks being mapped to the up and right C though, and instead of down and left are directly adjacent to A and B, which are used for heavy and light punch. This is basically where we're running into problems. Movement is mirrored, not mirrored is the wrong term, but duplicated between the d-pad and the directional stick as well which is which is fine um this is a game which would generally play better on the d-pad though the d-pad isn't still got a few issues on here now Mortal Kombat trilogy does let you remap the buttons so you can move the heavy and light kicks down to being closer to the punch buttons but it's still an issue as as by default it is an uncomfortable thumb reach and if it well any subsequent games or other fighting games as we come through this use a similar layout without the ability to, re to remap you start to see where the problems can come in now this is potentially if we were in the time an issue that could have been properly mitigated with a proper arcade or fight stick for the n64 somebody making something like the super nintendo advantage or the nes advantage for this console that was had a good solid arcade flight uh, arcade stick um and good proper arcade style button layout in that regard but we never got one of those and checking on some internet i didn't find anything like that by comparison the playstation also got a similar arcade stick um at launch the saturn's controller on its own is considered one of the best controllers for fighting games and it also again in turn got a proper uh, fight stick as well. I'm not sure why we didn't get one for the N64 though. My theory is this. Because of the combination of the D-pad and analog stick on the controller and how they're often used, we ended up in a situation where the developers couldn't come across it come to a agreed upon standard for how they wanted to do fighting game controls in the sense of you don't have Capcom and Midway or what have you sitting down and saying, okay, here's how we like, we're just going to do movement on D-pad or D-pad and analog sticker and use the same controls every time, which means that if you're a developer or a hardware developer making an arcade stick, you can't be confident that, oh, that analog stick on the controller, that second directional input, isn't going to be necessary. Or the, on the other hand, the D-pad isn't going to be necessary. So you are going to have to, well, mirror inputs for, or not mirror, but have some way of accounting for inputs for both. And that's where we run into problems. 
So, in short, because we never really got that proper arcade stick, I think that became kind of the bane for fighting games on this. And I don't know if this is necessarily a situation where if we'd gotten an arcade stick, a good proper arcade stick at launch, this would have just, everything would have mapped for whatever the arcade stick did. But in any case, we're kind of in this situation now. It makes Mortal Kombat Trilogy a difficult game to play in an unnecessary respect. And it also makes it difficult to recommend over other versions of the game, like, for example, the PlayStation Port. The N64 coverage continues with Wave Race 64, our second launch racing game, after Cruising USA last episode. We have notes on various race types and courses, but not course maps. It feels like Nintendo Power Editorial is kind of figuring out how to do guides for these games, which is why coverage is fairly light. Wave Race 64 is a pretty solid racing game of a more arcade style. It's pretty clear that much like with Pilot Wing 64, part of this game's raison d'etre is as a tech demo. In this case, to showcase the water effects on the N64, and in particular to showcase the game's physics. For having your racer cruising through the water, being bounced up by the waves, which again, showcasing the wave physics, and having to use certain button inputs to mitigate how much you jump or bounced and all this other sort of, sort of stuff to maintain control in the water. In particular, again, like the motion of the jet skis bouncing in the water is perhaps a spectacular way to highlight the changes from the Super Nintendo to the N64 in terms of having your player and other players or other characters to moving in a three-dimensional space in response to things in the environment, in response to three-dimensional motion within the environment, um, in a way that's very different from Mario 64. In Mario 64, you are still moving in three dimensions in the environment, both in terms of running, jumping, and that sort of thing, but also with the cannons and the flight hat. But this feels much more different in terms of how the concept is fundamentally executed. Basically, in terms of not so much, oh, this is 3D graphics, but 3D graphics and 3D physics impacting the way you play the game. Otherwise, the game controls fine on its own. Movement and responsiveness is straightforward. Nothing feels really sluggish. Honestly, so far, the N64 has been doing really well on racing games, like spectacularly okay on platforming games and really not so hot on fighting games. This could be a situation where going forward the the strong suit of this platform is going to be racing games. Now the big multimedia event of Shadows of the Empire, the big thing of this of well 1996 in terms of geek culture, it's coming out soon, and we have an excerpt of the Shadows of the Empire comic as a part of this. I will be covering the comic and the novel later, and actually probably the soundtrack too, um, as part of, of the Legends of the Force series, which you can also find on this YouTube channel at a later time, after I get through some more of the Batman stuff. Moving on to the Super Nintendo, which is still a going concern, we have notes on Donkey Kong Country 3, including Dixie Kong's new allies, new enemies, and notes on the first area of the game, but no real maps as yet. Donkey Kong Country 3 is not great, mainly due to swapping out Diddy Kong for the character of Kitty Kong. Kitty Kong is larger than Dixie and has a hitbox that's comparable to Donkey Kong, but Donkey Kong has a degree of fluidity of movement and... Um, with his move list has a degree of additional options that works with the character that makes him better to control whereas kitty kong is deliberately designed by the character's implied age ish i'm going to get to that to be a less proficient character at tra at traversal and is like the animations are done to be much more lumbering. I'm going to be blunt. 
But considering his physical size in comparison to Dixie, despite being called, quote, Kitty Kong, the characters implied increased strength above that of both Dixie and Diddy, indeed comparable to Donkey Kong, if not greater. And considering the game came out in the mid-90s, which, as a key person who grew up then, I remember a lot of extremely normalized, a casual ableism, especially of people with disabilities, in all levels of society. There's a chunk of me that's wondering. When this character was originally pitched, the character's gimmick was that they had a mental disability instead of being just a oversized baby, and then somebody said no, either at Rare or Nintendo, that forced them to redo Kitty Kong as an, again, an oversized child. In either case, the game is a definite step down from DKC 1 and 2. I feel like the game would have worked better if we just kind of completed the circle and had the team up now be between Dixie and Donkey Kong with what with the things that come with it. Donkey Kong still having to improve strength and ability to smash through objects in the environment, like having a ground smash as well, combined with also his ability to say cost Dixie to reach higher environments or ob objects, and plus Dixie's ponytail giving her a basically glide jump. Um, that would have worked better. In Counselor's Corner, we have a bunch of tips for boss fights for Final Fantasy III, particularly with the Phantom Train and the Atmos weapon. Street Fighter Alpha 2 is getting, surprise, surprise, a release on the Super Nintendo, and we have a complete move list for the game along with character profiles. Ready? Round Street Fighter Alpha 2 is a shockingly good port, not arcade perfect, not even close, but Considering the hardware, the arcade version blows this game out of the water completely. Still, the character animations are fluid. The general the man mechanics of the game are executed well and in a way that is true to the arcade version. So you could go from the arcade to this version and have it. And if you did well at the arcade, you could do well here and potentially vice versa. And the music, while not as good, is still all right. The backgrounds are completely static. The game even has loading, uh, loading times at multiple points going into matches, which is probably the first I've ever encountered this on a cartridge on a Super Nintendo game. And certainly, this counteracts the sort of advantage of the cartridge as being able to avoid having to go through these loading periods. So, ultimately, you'd still kind of be better playing this off on a Saturn or PlayStation instead of on the Super Nintendo contemporaneously. Nowadays, you got the Switch version. You can play it on your um, modern consoles installed where you don't have to worry about loading at all, off a disc at all. But still, managing to make this game at the level it is is still a tremendously considerable achievement worth lauding. I am deeply impressed that, th that they pulled this off. Going back in time, Miss Pac-Man is getting a Super Nintendo release, and there's a whole slew of notes on that. Well, it's a solid port of Miss Pac-Man. Um, the sprites have a little more detail to them than the arcade version of the game, with sort of a reflection shine on both the main sprite from Miss Pac-Man and on Pac-Man as well in the cutscenes. And the controls work well enough, though, from my experience, I've generally enjoyed playing Pac-Man better with an arcade stick than on a D-pad, actually. Or at least the Super Nintendo D-pad. In Epic Center News, we have more info on the upcoming Super Nintendo SimCity 2000 port. No featured review this issue. Instead, we have more info on the collaborative fiction project for The Legend of Zelda that was going on on Nintendo's AOL pages. In the Epic Strategy column, we have the locations of various hidden chests in the Super Mario RPG. 
And we have a translation of an interview with Shigeru Miyamoto from a Japanese video game magazine about game development for the N64 and the differences thereof between 64-bit and 16-bit consoles. Moving into Super Nintendo preview coverage, relating to our earlier discussion of Street Fighter Alpha 2, the Super Nintendo is getting its own variant of Mortal Kombat trilogy, which we can look forward to talking about at some point in the future, maybe. Additionally, there's a Super Nintendo Pinocchio platformer as well. We have a preview of the game with light notes on the levels, but nothing serious. I'm going to hold off on this for now. We have NBA Hangtime next, which is basically the next installment of NBA Jam for the Super Nintendo, and with the added addition of Create a Player. I'm going to hold off on reviewing this one because it's a generally fairly light coverage here. No team breakdown or anything like that. No, nothing too substantial. Next up is Prince of Persia 2, though, which has a proper guide this time. We have maps and notes for most of the game up to the last level. So Prince of Persia 2's fundamental problem is while the first game started you off with traversal and eased you into the combat... This game starts you off with the combat and follows with a bunch of really big jumps with really limited platforming. It's really frustrating when, well, your hat's making you fight a whole bunch of enemies, do the big jumps, and then because of the camera perspective and the looseness of the controls for this type of platforming, you end up dying a lot and having to start the sequence over and doing that repeatedly. Now, if, like, Prince of Persia 2 came right on the heels of Prince of Persia 1, I could go with it a little more, because then we'd have a situation where, okay, as a player, it how the game controls and the idiosyncrasies, um, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, of Prince of Persia's control scheme, as far as the original version, would be more fresh in my memory, and I could work off of those instead of having to deal with this. It makes for a tremendously frustrating part of the game that I could, I could see leading people to push through it when you've bought the game and you're stuck with it, and that's what you got to play for a while. But that level of semi-obligation, the feeling of being stuck with the game and obligated to power through it, it's honestly not fun. In classified information, we have some info on how to get the chip enhancer for Mega Man X3, along with some classic codes for some recently reprinted games. Our second to last game of the issue is the Game Boy port of Tetris Attack, with some notes on gameplay modes. Now, the Game Boy version of Tetris Attack is a pretty well done port of the game, which replaces the competitive single player mode of the game with one where there's more of a series of slightly progressively more involved puzzles that you have to do clear to down to a certain level. And this version of the game basically does right everything you would need to do to turn this into a game that was more suited for play on the go. It divides the game up to bite-sized chunks that you can pick up in later areas. It makes it lets you pick up where you left off with varying degrees and generally works much more solidly for that level of play, for level play on a train or bus or waiting room or that sort of thing. It's what you want. And consequently, I do definitely recommend picking up this version of the game. And we wrap up our games this issue with a double dual pack of Battle Zone and Super Breakout in a retro arcade pack, with also enhancements for the Super Nintendo. Of the two titles in this pack, Battle Zone is the strongest of the two, with better controls and a generally more fun experience. The graphical perspective is still fairly limited due to the nature of the Game Boy or Super Game Boy screen, but it works. Super Breakout, on the other hand, though, it's, it's Breakout. By this point, and by this point I mean when this game came out, we are living in a world where not only Arkanoid exists, but Arkanoid has exists and has gotten a Game Boy version. And it has blow and that and similar games have blown Breakout just out of the water in terms of games where you're smashing blocks with a ball bounced off a paddle. So Super Breakout just pales by comparison. It doesn't do any level of Donkey Kong 94 
expanding on and enriching the concept. In the now playing column, the also ran here is Lufia 2, which I'm surprised didn't get more focused coverage instead of the interact or collaborative fiction project, but hey. And I think, and as it is, I suspect that we'll get some further re review coverage soon. Finally, the Packwatch column for this issue has more coverage of Blast Core and of Killer Instinct Gold. My pick of the issue is Wave Race 64. While I am deeply, deeply impressed with the quality of work on the Super Nintendo version of Street Fighter Alpha 2, there are so many other versions of it that provide better graphical fidelity and the same level of control on later and contemporary platforms. Um, uh, PlayStation and like PlayStation got it beat at this time. Um, and now it's available on Switch and PlayStation 4 and Xbox and that sort of thing as well in the Street Fighter Anniversary Collection. So there are much better ways to play something closer to the arcade version of the game. Wave Race 64, on the other hand, showcases the N64's capabilities spectacularly while still being a game that is fun to play on the N64 controller. Makes for a much better pick. Round one, fight! Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe, and also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any f future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.